One of the best ways you can understand something is by playing around with it, poking it with a stick, and see how it works. And in science, we do this all the time to discover new, amazing things. And I think in honor of ideal gases being a really plain topic, I am going to use it as an excuse to teach you the basics of how to play scientifically. And by the end of this video, we'll see how playing gives rise to new discoveries and exciting practical applications in science. Let's get started! Imagine you're a scientist trying to understand how gases work. You kind of have a rough intuition of how gases work. Gases expand and contract. Gases exert pressure and containers. Temperature makes gases more volatile. And the number of molecules in a gas tends to increase its volume. So let's say these four things are the control knobs of your gas. But as you start getting your hands in there and play with the knobs, you notice that changing one of these knobs makes some others change in ways that aren't very obvious. So you may ask, well, what does the behind the scenes of this look like? And even more so, how can we figure this out? After trying various ways of testing these knobs and dials, you came across a very good way of testing the relationships between the knobs. If you just froze all the other knobs and only tested two of them at the same time, you can actually gain a much deeper insight into the two. For example, if you froze the volume, the number of molecules, the temperature makes the gas pressure increase. And you write that down, temperature changes pressure. And seeing that relationship, you try to make a graph out of it and put equations in there while you're at it. And you find that the pressure increases proportionally with temperature. So we've been able to extract a relationship out of these two by just freezing the other variables. So now let's try the same thing, except this time, let's freeze pressure in place and allow the volume to change. Now you see that the volume increases with temperature in a similar fashion. Now let's do the same thing by freezing temperature this time and allowing pressure and volume to freely move around. And you see the relationship between pressure and volume actually isn't the same as the previous two relationships. If you try to increase the volume, the pressure will decrease to compensate. And if you try the opposite, increasing the pressure, the volume will decrease to compensate. And to unveil things a little bit more, you try to try this with different temperatures and you see that the temperature is kind of the quantity that governs how much volume and pressure this gas can take on. And I'm not going to show it, but for the number of molecules, the relationship is very similar to how temperature governs pressure and volume. We can combine these relationships and we've now managed to reverse engineer how gases, at least ideal ones, work. And this is only just relevant for thermodynamics. This way of thinking is used everywhere in science. By only isolating two variables and seeing how they can affect each other, we can uncover what is seemingly mysterious within nature. Cool, but now you may be wondering, well, we understand how these things work now, but how do we create anything meaningful from it? Well, I'm glad you actually asked because we're going to be using our knowledge of ideal gases that we've just built up in conceptualizing the most efficient heat engine in the world. Well, specifically, we're going to be looking at the power stroke, the part where the gas expands to push the piston. But well, let's ask ourselves first, what is expansion? Intuitively, when you think of a gas expanding, it's easy to picture a cloud increasing in size while dispersing at the same time. To make it controlled, let's just say that the cloud is trapped within our piston, and the size increase pushes the piston up. And this pushing up of the piston is caused by the gas doing work on the piston. But we can go a little bit deeper and ask, well, what is work then? 
And to do that, we have to go back to physics for that definition. Work is the energy you use to move an object by a certain displacement with some force. For our piston, it works out to be that the force is equal to pressure times the area of the piston. And the displacement is the change in volume divided by that same area. Conveniently, the areas cancel out. And for a gas, this is how you calculate work. More specifically, if you're expanding, you're using the energy from the system to do the expansion. So we put a negative sign on the pressure times change in volume to denote that. And this definition of expansion work is why we're working with pressure and volume as our axes. If you expand a gas to a certain pressure, then the work done is equal to the area underneath the graph of this pressure volume or PV diagram. One thing of note is that even if you began with a higher pressure inside the piston than outside, the work done is still only dependent on the pressure pushing it outside, since that's the force you're actually pushing against. So like before, now that we've understood expansion, let's move on to seeing all sorts of expansions we could do. And our job here is to find the expansion that maximizes the amount of work done so that we can push as much as possible in the power stroke of our engine. Let's be a little bit more specific here and let's say we have the entire system at constant temperature. The reason why is that it simplifies the problem a little bit so it's easier to work with. And what that means is that the gas can only take on these certain pressures and volumes. If we do a simple expansion against a constant external pressure, then it's just the same as earlier, a square shaped area for the work done. So in the spirit of playfulness, let's use something that's more out of the blue and say we lower the external pressure just halfway so that the volume just doesn't go all the way up and only letting it go on the second push. And well, what do you know? There is a difference and you actually end up with more work than you would in the previous case. Aha! So the trick here is to lower the pressure a little bit, let the whole system adjust, then keep lowering this pressure in step by step until you reach your desired pressure. And if you became more gradual and gradual and gradual in lowering the pressure in smaller and smaller increments, then the amount of work you gain approaches the curve we drew for constant temperature. And that is how you bring the most work out of your system, one part of the most efficient engine possible. But as you can see, there's a glaring caveat. It takes a really long time to extract that energy since you're only lowering in small and small and small steps. However, there are a lot of things that you can take away from this regardless of it being completely impractical. From just playing around with ideal gases in the ways you're not really supposed to. First of all, we've touched on the concept of adding and removing things in such a small quantity that it's so small that it's negligible. It's even safe to say that nothing has really happened in one of these very small steps. And if we put it that way, if we reverse this process, it would have felt like nothing had just happened. This idea, you guessed it, is thermodynamic reversibility. And it's the only type of action you can do that does not generate entropy. And this will come up a lot, not only in our discussion of toy gases, but also in a transition between liquids and solids, and perhaps in the most important idea in chemistry, chemical equilibrium. But this doesn't just stop here. Let's take a look back at the way we did the expansions. Even though we just got here from the same initial state and want to go to the same final state, you see that the work done to get us there is drastically different. So the path taken actually matters for work. And not only that, but since the change in temperature is zero, the internal energy doesn't change as well. So therefore, by leveraging the first law, the size of the work done is going to be equal to the amount of heat sucked in. And that also makes the heat 
as dependent on the path as work. And that's why heat and work are referred to as path variables. The internal energy, on the other hand, doesn't care about which path you take. The same pressures and volumes always gives rise to the same temperatures, at least in ideal gases. So in the end, the path you take doesn't affect the internal energy. Only where you start and end up matters. And this is why internal energy is a state variable as opposed to path variables in work and heat. And for practical purposes, state variables are much, much more convenient to deal with since you can simply ignore the path you took and everything just boils down to simple plus and minus calculations. Well, this might be cool and all, but come on, give me some real practical applications like measuring something for months. Well, since this episode has gone for long enough, that's what the next episode is going to be about. We'll be leveraging the ideas planted in this video in the next episode. But for this episode, you can see that the simple idea of playing around cleverly with nature, we can uncover the mysterious puzzle that lies beneath it and use the insights we've gained to create and discover new things. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.